so this poem is, is pretty new and it's called The Specimen Dream. Everyone was talking about the weather, the year we learned to fear a touch. We were so lovely and unharmed a girl ago. Oracles marked by fits and starts, fluent only in rapture. Slow limbed and grass stained, amnesiac after the first sip. Want to listen to this Ivory Tower Boiler Room or True Crime and Academia episode ad-free? Head on over to our Patreon where I'm giving you all seven days of a free trial. So P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com backslash Ivory Tower Boiler Room. And if you join the ITBR professor level, which you'll see gets you access to all of our rewatch podcast series like Queer as Folk and Smash, and all of our Teaches series, including when we rewatched Scream with you all, when we discussed The Exorcist. We're about to do a Britney Spears memoir episode. So, oh, and The Fall of the House of Usher is coming up. You also get access to both book clubs. And while you're at it, while you're joining our Patreon, where you're getting your seven days for free, I would really love if you... Make sure you like and follow us on Apple or Spotify, and please leave a review. It really does help us in terms of advertisers and sponsors. Thank you all for listening to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room Network, and it is just wonderful to be part of this arts and culture organization and have you all out there reach out to me. So again, remember, follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Ivory Tower Boiler Room. And we have a Facebook and we're on X as well. Enjoy this episode, everyone. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and welcome back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. When I say that my guest here, who is just looking at me with such excited and eager eyes on the Zoom screen is someone who I just hold really deep in my heart. And I always have a special place for my guests, but I've known this guest since 2019 at least. And we just had such a bond and we'll probably open up about that. And just, we had a beautiful conversation every time that I would see her. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to the creative genius, in my opinion, that is Lindsay Tuggle, who is the author of The Afterlives of Specimens from 2017, which is a really beautifully done Whitmanic, Walt Whitman um, academic book, but also explores her creativity as well. I feel you're going between both worlds. So I think that'll be a good opening for us to talk about academic versus creative writing and you know are there really differences or can you intersect them uh it was glowingly reviewed by the new york review of books um commonplace and american literary history all have glowing reviews of her book and then i was talking to lindsay before i hit record i absolutely love her debut poetry collection and i'm going to say the kentuckian way uh which is valenture uh from 2018 is such a beautiful collection and it was named one of the Australians books of the year and shortlisted for the Association for the Study of Australian Literature's Mary Gilmore Award and Australian Poetry's Ann Elder Award. Uh, so Lindsay's work has appeared in so many venues from the New York, New York Review of Books, the North American Review, the Walt Whitman Quarterly Review. He Rabbit Poetry, I just wanted to read that, Red Room <laughs> Poetry, Commonplace, Anthology of Contemporary Australian Feminist Poetry, and she's won so many grants and fellowships from the Library of Congress to the Mutter Museum in my nearby Philadelphia, uh, you know, where I grew up. And also, she is coming to us straight from, or still in, uh, her writer in residency in Champaign. And I'll have her actually pronounce the name so I don't butcher it. But Lindsay, <laughs> without further ado, it means so much that you're here in the ivory tower boiler room. 
Andrew, it's it's a delight and it's been one of the great delights of my academic career to just watch you flourish and watch what you've created with this podcast. It's really an accomplishment. So thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Well, first, how long um, are you in this writer in residency? It actually just finished. Um, it was the month, the month of September. Um, so I left, I was in Chateau Orkvaux, which is in Champagne. And um, it's a really extraordinary residency program. It's very interdisciplinary and very geographically diverse. So they try to have a mix of different creative practitioners, um, visual artists, writers, performance artists, filmmakers, musicians, um, and people from different ages, different ethnicities, different geographic locations. So it's just this incredible kind of prism um, of creativity um, where I was sort of incubating for the last month and I'm still a little bit in the afterglow. Well, I know we'll open up more about the afterglow and just how you're <laughs> processing that September experience. I think first, I've just always been so interested in your work, but even let's go before your published work, which is the Lindsay Tuggle who decided to um, go get a PhD. Like, do you remember what was going through your mind when you realized, okay, this is what I want to do now in my academic journey? Like, there's something pulling me towards it. Like, do you remember what was pulling you towards a PhD? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a strange biographical turn. It's not without um, tragedies and and sort of ninety degree U turns. But my um, many years ago, my first career was in social work and trauma social work. Um, and at a certain stage in that, I had a bereavement. My sister died, and the nature of the work I was doing was really confronting. So I knew I was on the threshold of burnout. Um, and so I took some time and ended up in Australia. And then I sort of just didn't leave um, and ended up going back to school. I thought I had the realization that I just wasn't in a place where I could continue with the, the kind of work, which was gender violence advocacy work and working with survivors that I thought would be my life's work. Um, and I, I didn't really say oh, I can't do this forever but I certainly knew for the foreseeable future it was a little bit beyond me um so I went back to school thinking I might like to teach high school English and started doing English literature courses at the University of Sydney and then just kept going and just kept going and um when I finished what we call an honors, which is kind of like a miniature master's in, in US um, academic lexicon, um, the opportunity came to apply for a scholarship for the PhD. And I thought, well, I'll apply. And if I get it, then that's a sign. Um, and that's how I got there. Oh, wow. Well, something just now, even having my diploma and that official glow of the PhD, like, oh, wow, I am Dr. You know, Rimby, or, you know, you are Dr. Tuggle, right? Was that your, is, is that your maiden name, Lindsay? It is, yes. Okay, okay. Just want to make sure, because on your <laughs> screen, I see Sloan, and I'm like, wait, um, I hope I'm getting the, no, yeah, I'm getting the actually, time period right. Yeah, I still, I'm still Tuggle in all my writing life, and all my professional life, um, but I do kind of have this sort of secret private name, which I quite love. Like, I didn't think that would be a thing um, that I would ever be interested in. But somehow, um, when we finally decided to get married, which is a not a podcast conversation, I thought, well, I think I'd really like to have a whole other person in my private life, <laughs> whole other identity. So yeah, sorry for the... No, um, I love that. <laughs> it's like the anonymity. It, it makes sense. But something that I've been conscious of and I would love you know your thoughts on it is and everyone did tell me and I was very mindful and aware every celebration or graduation moment even the defense like thank goodness I got permission to record the presentation and I have it on YouTube like I have all the markers presented but after right you receive the diploma and then you think wait 
I did it. Like it was like, wait, this was nine years of my life. And I went right from my undergrad, Lindsay. This is 12 years I was in college. And what is Andrew Rimby without college? And like, there was a whole month of, I mean, I'm still questioning things, but thank goodness I have this business that I created. But it is a moment of, wait, do I just keep applying? Do I have to be at a university? And then when it came into my mind, oh, no one's forcing me to be at a university. That was where I got this degree. But look at all the skills you've amassed, Andrew. But it's that industry of the university. It is such a pull after your PhD, in my opinion. And it, it can be very frightening to your identity as an academic, I feel, when you realize that you might not be at a university and to try to come to your own terms with that. I mean, is that something that speaks to you, Lindsay? Hugely. It's incredibly resonant. And, you know, I'm once again, as I said before, we, you know, formally started, you are on a trajectory that's light years ahead of some of the realizations that I had, you know, as an early career researcher. And I think um, there is a sense in which we must be a bit more transparent about what the institution can offer and about the context in which it can do great harm um, to doctoral students, to early career researchers. You know, there are extraordinary gifts and generous um, mentors, but the institutions themselves at the moment, I think many of them are failing our doctoral students and our early career researchers, whether by intention or by benign neglect or by, you know, direct harm. Um, and I think, you know, one of the one of the ways in which that failure occurs, one of the more benign ways, is not being transparent about what jobs are available. Um, and also about not, not teaching um, our early career researchers, how applicable their skill set is beyond the ivory tower. And that's why I think the work that you're doing is so groundbreaking and important, you know. Well, um, that really warms my heart. I mean, Lindsay, it's just true because like I'm even having tears in my eyes right now because it's not just you're confirming, like validating what I'm doing, but to realize everything you're saying of the harm of the institution. I always say now, especially after getting my PhD, there are not specific people who harmed or who I would pass blame to. I had such a wonderful department. I always say I loved my director and I still have such a good relationship with her and the committee. It's not that. It's yeah. like you said, the organization. And I think sometimes... In the university, people are so nervous to speak out because they think that they're blaming individual people. But the failure of an organization or of any industry is not about one person. And it's like the writer's strike or even reality TV stars wanting a union. Like that's not about specific people. That's about this institution hasn't supported all of our creativity and endeavors. And we want more. Like we demand more respect. And that's how I so feel with academia right now is you keep saying that the humanities teaches your undergrads and graduate students how to work outside of the university. But is this reflected in the actual, like you said, the methodology, the learning tools, the like, do you have people from different industries in your faculty, or are they like coming to do presentations and workshops? And I feel like there's still such a separation of this is what happens in the bubble of the university. And then this is the outside world. But well, we want you to be in the outside world after this degree. Good luck. It's it just, it's very hard to understand, you know, how the administrations are constructing the role of the university right now, in my opinion. Like, it's great. Like you said, it's great to go for a PhD, but you need to be honest with the students 
and not just train them for academic jobs. Like you need to now train them for media jobs, for publication jobs, for, I don't know, legal jobs, for anyone who has a PhD in English, find them, like find them in industries. Mm. I mean, that's where I would start. Yeah, and I think the thing that, that is really, you know, critical for me is that we, you know, anyone who emerges from a PhD in literature, for example, because that's what we know best, has, you know, these close reading skills, these skills of argumentation, these skills of long form analysis, whether that's reading analysis or writing analysis, that are incredibly valuable and increasingly rare. So that's already happening. What is, I think, often not happening is um, teaching those young scholars or those emerging scholars how to articulate those skills in a market because we don't like to think of ourselves as being in a market right and it's a shame that we are but you know this is all kind of intrinsic on um I think you know part of the fact that many of many universities depend so much on unpaid labor you know whether that's the unpaid labor of graduate students or early career um, scholars and teachers who are, you know, just not paid for a, a lot of the work that they do, or whether that's tenured professors who are now working such long hours that, you know, it, it takes them seven days a week. To, it's, it's sort of ubiquitous. And so I think um, this sort of denial of a value um, is as it, like it's a systemic problem, you know, um, and it, it links up with other systemic problems like the writer's strike, you know, that you reference. And once you're outside the university, right, and I'm seeing this now with how I'm negotiating with sponsors or negotiating now in my consulting business that I'm doing with the podcast, and I'm like helping someone right now with their thesis and, you know, just realizing you know, I would love to say that money is not a concern, but you start to realize that time is such a value. And like, that's why I'm so transparent here, Lindsay, that, you know, Lindsay decided to come on here, you know, for free, but like, we're both, you know, helping support one another, like artistically and creatively. And I think it's so good to just be transparent. And I don't know, I'm all about communication and honesty. I think if people were just honest, like now I've had to decline some things in more academic venues just because I realized, wait, these types of opportunities are more for full-time faculty where they have funds from their department to pay for this. But when you're an independent scholar or on the outside, you have to fund this yourself. Like I... I'm trying to find, luckily there are grants to help support my business that I'm going to start to apply for. And I am going to start to go to conferences. I'm going to the MLA in um, January. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I actually got invited to speak about my podcast, like in one of their presentation rooms. So what I'm doing now is if I go to a conference, I've just decided it has to make sense with the work I do, but also connecting back to the media space I'm in. Like it needs to be an ivory tower boiler room mm -hmm. discussion or talk. And like I even am probably going to a Gothic um, symposium in March in Salem to cover, because I had this whole idea that I want to cover interviews in real time. Like, wouldn't it be great if there was an on the ground media presence at a conference who had short interviews with every or with those who want to talk about their work they're doing there. Just because I always feel in academia, we're always missing the after effect of a conference. Like, why not have an archive? Like, why not tell the public what happens here? And I realized, well, you know what, Lindsay, this is the best place for me because I get to dictate the terms because we don't have a model. Like, we don't have a red carpet in academia and all these outlets. It's a whole new space for us. And you're so right that we do have to start, you know, we do have to start to shift beyond the borders, you know, and I, I think what really resonates with me with what you're saying, like I think of myself these days as a recovering academic. That's my little, my little 12 step joke. Um, 
But it resonates a lot with people. And it, even with myself, you know, you talk about the pull of the ivory tower. You know, I made the decision to leave um, the university. I'm trying to do the math here around about six or seven years after my PhD. Um, and, you know, it wasn't, it, it was a little bit like giving up something that you love a great deal, but that isn't always good for you. Um, and it was a slow burn and there was some push and pull, you know. Um, at the end of the day, for me, part of the realization was in having like some encounters with my own mortality and with the fragility of the physical body and realizing you know, in a very, and I think being schooled in Whitman kind of primes you for this, right? To, to think of the decaying body as transcendent and the human body is always, you know, in a state of both decay and regeneration. Um, and I'm sitting with that and sitting on all of those, you know, decades of Whitman research and, and realizing I don't want to claw out space for my poetry between 4 and 7 a.m. anymore. Like I'm unwilling and I've got, you know, long form projects that I want to write, like I'm writing a novel right now um, that I'm just never going to be able to do in this particular ecosystem. Um, but having that realization and actually being able to leave, whether that's like psychologically or whether it's financially, you know, and I think as a poet, as a writer, um, as a creative, you've got to kind of be real with people about that stuff as well, because it's all super hard and we all have to eat, we have to pay rent, we have to have day jobs, you know, um, part of the, the danger um, and the thing that makes us vulnerable is that we are doing this work out of love. And whenever that's your primary motivation, someone can, you know, can exploit that. Um, if if we're not savvy, if we're not, um, you know, kind of keeping an eye. Hi, this is Dr. Andrew Rimby. And when I'm not here on the podcast, I am consulting with small businesses, undergraduate students, graduate students, podcasters, and those in media. So if you're curious about the work that I've done with my consultation services, you could just type me in on Google, Ivory Tower Boiler Room, and you'll see a few reviews pop up. I've worked on college admission essays for undergraduate students. I've revamped and expanded a small business's social media marketing campaign right here in Port Jefferson, New York. And I've also worked on a graduate student's thesis for her physician assistant program. So if you want to seek me out or inquire about my consultation services, just email me. That's the easiest way to reach me at ivorytowerboilerroom at gmail.com. That's easy to remember. And tis the season for college admission essays, both undergraduate and graduate, thesis writing, dissertation writing. Um, do you want to create a podcast and you don't know where to begin? Media work. Um, how to open a TikTok, how to start creating videos on TikTok, what to do with your Instagram, all of that I have done. So just reach out to me. Also, I'm really excited to announce that the December book club choice is Britney Spears's The Woman in Me memoir. So to join the book club, head to ivorytowerboilerroom.com and go to events and you're going to see a form there just so I know how many of you are joining the book club. And that way I can reach out to each of your email addresses and poll all of you to see what date at the end of December works. It's going to be the week after Christmas. So don't worry, it's not going to be the week of Christmas. That would be hectic. And then I'll let you all know how to join the book club, which happens on Patreon. You just join under the ITBR book club section. So can't wait to see who wants to discuss Britney Spears. We have a lot to dissect there. And in the also, if you want to join the Wicked Broadway Musical group event, which is happening in March, head to that event section on the website and fill out that Google form by December 1st. 
Ah, so much happening here in the ivory tower boiler room. And I love this community. I love being the host and director of this arts and culture organization. Thank you all for supporting me. It means so much. And please spread the word for my consultation services for the podcast, the book club, the Broadway musical group event, all the things. And without further ado, Here's today's episode. LGBT stories are universal, but each one speaks to the individual heart and soul of the writer telling it. Do you have a story to tell? Or have you been moved by an LGBT book, film, painting, television show, or other form of media? Then the Gay and Lesbian Review wants to hear from you. The GNLR believes in bringing awareness to queer art and artists through reviews, commentary, and thought pieces in which the author relates their personal lives to a particular piece of art, a novel, a movie. In addition to the print magazine, the GNLR also publishes articles on its blog. So you can see all of this on glreview.org. That's G-L-R-E-V-I-E-W.org. Remember, you get 50% off your subscription of the GL Review magazine when you use the promo code ITBR50. That's 50% off your print or digital subscription when you use promo code ITBR50. To learn more about submitting an article for the GNLR, Visit their writer's guidelines. The link is located at the bottom of their homepage. And if you have any questions, email Stephen Hemrick. That's S-T-E-P-H-E-N dot H-E-M-R-I-C-K at glreview.org. The GNLR and its readers can't wait to see what you have to say. Oh, yes work jobs that you're i feel we all should be passionate in the work we do but when your whole career is based around the passion of the study of that object in front of you it's so ripe for manipulation by negative actors Mm -hmm. and i think just realizing oh it's not me like i getting away like i've gotten away from that failure mentality or um like andrew you did something um you had to validate yourself and you just didn't do a good enough sales pitch of validating yourself to the university and then i said wait the jobs just aren't there i mean to be realistic here also the jobs are there but the jobs that are there are ones that i feel you're getting really low pay right now for doing four to five classes a semester teaching. And like you said, I thought, wait, Andrew, there's no way you could continue to have your business. Like it just isn't feasible. And I thought, well, maybe I should be an entrepreneur. Like I already am. Why not just hit full throttle and go for it and see this is, The way I feel, Lindsay, is this is the time now for me to just be as creative as possible and take a chance on myself. Because if I don't do this now, no one's ever going to say to me, Andrew, why don't you go back to that project and business you started? Like things, distractions happen, life, you know, happens. And I'm lucky enough that I have funds right now to just help support me through this growing period. And I always think the university's door is open It's not like it's shut behind me, but I do feel now it would have to be a place that really values my talents and my work. And I'm not going to keep begging. Like, I'm not going to just send out applications because I feel that I need that validation from the university. And it's right. It's tough because I never want to sound like an embittered employee um, or a scorned lover, but <laughs> we have to do, we have to do what's like you said, you just felt the burnout happening. And I also felt that during my PhD. I mean, I love what I've learned from my PhD and my dissertation, and I wouldn't have started this business without it. You know, you can bet <laughs> your bottom dollar on that. Um, but it's like you said, what Whitman had taught me or queer poetics taught me is how to reach the LGBTQ community out there. Like everyone listening right now, who's part of that community, it helped me reach you like them. It's, 
realizing what you can do with that academic talent, but then making it fit your lifestyle and being, I'm telling you, Lindsay, being an entrepreneur with flexible hours, there's a lot of the financial obstacles are always going to be there, but there is so much freedom of creativity. It's like probably the way you feel right now with your finishing the writer in residence and just that energy. Yeah. And look, you know, again, there's just so much intersectionality between our experiences, um, although it just maybe took me a little bit longer <laughs> to wake up to it. But, you know, I think this realization that um, you, you look at a particular opportunity, like a job application, or even once I left the university and was, you know, pursuing writing full time, you know, I would look at grant applications for writers um, or various residencies. And I, I made a decision right in the middle, right, right as COVID was beginning, it wasn't related to COVID, that I was no longer going to apply for things where the application process was so intensive that I could have gone off and made a body of work, you know, not a, po you know, a poem, poems can take a really long time. Sometimes that's just their kind of germination process. But if I could have gone away and written an essay or a chapter of my novel um, in the amount of time or for the same kind of composite words as what an application was asking of me, I just decided to vote with my feet. And there's absolutely a degree of privilege in that. You know, I also resonate with the conference thing that you said, um, you know, of um, I, my, my partner sort of was so incredulous at this. You pay, you pay to work, you pay to go and <laughs> go and do this, you know? So I think like getting real with yourself about what is valuable and what context you want to move through. And I have to say, like, I'm so happy to hear you say that you're leaning hard into the media um, and the entrepreneurial spirit, because when you were emerging with your degree, I thought, oh, I really hope Andrew is able to keep going with the podcast and the community that's growing around it. Like it's unlike anything I've ever seen. It, I've said to you before, but it, it is breaking down these barriers that are what you call the ivory tower. We call the sandstone university um, and showing the ways in which um, the work that we do, it is, it is resonant for people. Um, and, it, you know, it's a, it's a question of translation. It's a question of not being constrained by those borders. Yes. And having to access, like you're writing, right? You said you're writing a novel right now. You think of audience. These are questions that of reach, who you're reaching out to, that you really learn how to, I really, I'll say it right now. I dislike that phrase, dumbing down anything. I just, I find it an offensive phrase. I also just think that we're selling ourselves short to think that people of all different education levels or professions or the people you just meet in your day-to-day -day life, they will understand. It's about how we connect. How do you find common ground of what they're bringing to the table and what you're bringing to the table. And there was a part of me, there is a self-congratulatory pat on the back that I've observed in universities. And it's just, it's a part that I had to unpack, which is like, when I say that validation from the university, I mean, just that, which I'm sure you can recognize that behavior as well. It's only speaking a certain language of lexicon terminology. And I'm thinking, this is not really like, maybe that makes you feel that your, um, your ego has ma mastered a certain level of knowledge. But I feel that with all of our knowledge and education, shouldn't we not be trying to seek out the same people? Shouldn't we be seeking out the people who would love to read, but they just haven't maybe found the right book or they're not sure how to access the public library? Like once you open their mind to, oh, that novel, Lindsay, you're working on, what a great premise. Like 
that plot sounds fascinating. And I feel because of my podcast, I'm always talking about guests I've had on to anyone I'm encountering. And they always will say, oh, I'll have to look up that person's work or that book. And it does, in my opinion, this is the work I've wanted to do, which is also to spread the love of arts and culture, because I feel like we're very deeply in need of not just those who will always find arts and culture because they'll always exist. You know, the bibliophiles will be there as a small subsection always, even in the dark ages, I'm sure they were there. But mm -hmm. I feel like it's the people who are always consuming arts and culture, but they're haven't latched on to or had the light bulb moment of that's what I'm doing. Like just to even be cognizant and aware. I love spreading that awareness because it, it ripples. It's so true. And I think, you know, um, I mean, my favorite teaching experience that I ever had was something I did with Red Room Project, um, Red Room Poetry in Australia, which was where we went in and taught poetry workshops in prisons. Um, and it was a transform, literally a transformative experience for me. Um, I worked with young male offenders age 18 to 25, and I really came up against my own biases and expectations. You know, um, we, um, put together, we, and we really weren't sure like what's going to be the portal. Um, and we worked very closely with their teachers, their literacy and language teachers, um, who kind of applied for the funding to have this project. And, you know, they were very um, clear with us that, you know, it needs to be something that they can find, um, you know, like a, um, a reciprocal mirror or a way to get, you know, a passage in. So we looked at anthologies that had come out of other prisons. You know, we looked at poetry that had been written in various kinds of enclosure or incarceration. And what I found very quick, quickly was what they responded to was you being real and personal and vulnerable. And so they, you know, we wrote poetry together um, and, you know, we did kind of like exquisite corpse style things where each person writes a line. And the more fragile you were willing to be, um, the, the greater they would meet you there. But the most extraordinary thing what, that I sort of realized is, you know, I would put together um, a lot of um, text that I thought would be relatable to them. And of all the things that we read, the thing they most responded to was the poet Ann Carson's long elegy for her brother Knox. Um, and there was a there's a particular line in there, always a comfort to know there is a secret behind what torments you. Mm. And this was the poem, because each there there are these kind of one-line poems with collages. Um, and they each wrote a response to that poem. And, and many of the students acknowledge this as being the most generative of all the exercises that we did. Um, you know, and Ann Carson is a feminist classicist, you know, and this is who they, they also loved Susan Howell because she's writing all over the page, you know. So I think you're absolutely right. Like the issue is not with the art. The issue is with how we talk about the art. And are we creating these barriers? Because, you know, and I say we when really not you and I, but is, you know, is academia creating barriers that don't actually exist? And if so, why? As opposed to, you know, creating a portal or a through line. Um, well, it's kind of, I don't know how it was at University of Sydney, right, Lindsay? Is that, okay. I'm assuming that's one of the largest universities in Sydney, um, right? Like, do you remember how many students are at University of Sydney, like an estimate? I am terrible with numbers. So oh, okay. I'm going to ballpark that. For a Civil War scholar, I have to always check my dates. I'm just not a numbers person. But yeah, it's one of Australia's largest universities. So there's sort of these, what we call the sandstone universities that are kind of like the Ivies. And so uh, it would okay. be in that category. 
Wait, why is it called sandstone? I have to ask. <laughs> They're made out of sandstone. They're very beautiful. And so they, um, like I think in the States, it would depend where geographically, geographically you are, what kind of stone um, mm-hmm. an hour 19th century or 18th century building would be made of. But in Australia, it's almost always sandstone. Um, yeah. That's just what we've got. <laughs> yeah. Well, luckily, you know, to help, uh, find our numbers. We have Google, and it. I just saw seventy three thousand, <laughs> um, seventy three thousand, and I already see photos of University of Sydney. How? Oh, and it's a public university. Oh, okay, see that's, um, you know, do you feel that the Australian system, because you've you know been in both, right? If everyone out there doesn't know, because of Lindsay's what I call more of a transatlantic accent, um, (laughs) just from all your journeying and being in the States, being in Australia, now, you know, you're in uh, France, but, um, or you've been in France. Is there a big difference between the American system, in your opinion, and like the European Australian when it comes to these boundaries you're talking about? Um, Most definitely. Um, I think... I can't speak too much to the European context, although I do have a very dear friend, um, Stephanie Schaefer, who I met. We were both at the Library of Congress as Kluge Fellows a decade ago. Um, And we just sort of like fell into each other's lives in a a really um, adhesive way. (laughs) Um, And his borrowing a Whitman term. (laughs) <laughs> there's there's a lot of adhesiveness there. Um, and so I was with her in Germany right before I went to to um, Champagne for the residency. Um, so I have a glimpse through her experience and also through um, another friend of ours, Alaria Andrioli, um, who's based in Paris. Um, and Stephanie also is doing a podcast. Her podcast is called The Transatlanticist. So, you know, that's there's all there's some. Um, I think through lines with what you're doing and I think a little bit more of a sense because in Europe there is much more public funding and much more of a sense of this is, um, you know, this is a endeavor that has benefit and that is expected to have benefit for the collective. You know, I think mm-hmm. um, in America there's an absence sometimes of collectivist thinking. Um, Australia is a bit of a strange beast because in theory, the universities are public, but because we've had so many funding cuts for decades from both sides of government, like we have a real kind of anti-intellectual strain in Australian culture and politics that crosses both sides of politics. Our Labour Party comes out of the union movement and they've, you know, um, they've also cut funding pretty drastically um, in the in the decades that I've lived there. So because of that, the universities have kind of somewhat privatized by offering degrees, um, whether they're international degrees or a portion of degrees locally for, that are for full fee paying students. And how that's changed since I left the institution, I can't really speak to. Um, but it does create this kind of hybrid model. Um, and I think, yeah, in Australia, um, yes, there's definitely a sense in which, um, I think we could do better, or I say we, and I'm not really part of the institution anymore, but, um, academia could do better at articulating the ways in which, um, you know, our research, our teaching is, valuable and intrinsic to like collective good to societal good yeah yeah and I know like um myself you're also so interested in not only abstract boundaries of creative ideas but also setting like I really feel geography and just how a place is located really does impact the public's awareness so even say a Stony Brook University it's so interesting to me because um, it's almost like um, 
Rutgers in a way where they're just very self-contained and they're not really in the community. And I do feel that that really sets a tone. Um, and again, the community also is responsible for that. Like some communities really don't want uh, students around their stores, which I still I don't understand because that doesn't help the economy. But uh, <laughs> But then, like, I went back recently to my undergrad in North Jersey, and it's called Kane, and it's, like, right in Union, and it's only 25 minutes from Manhattan. The train is on campus. I mean, it was idyllic being there. And going back and seeing, you know, the nostalgia was wonderful. But, like, they've built this whole condos around the campus and all of the restaurants. And even when you're not even on campus and you're in the town, Lindsay, they have flags for Kane University everywhere in their downtown. And I'm like, that to me, it's like Rowan. I'm not sure if you know that university, but I grew up near there in South Jersey. And it's the same thing. Like students can use their money at all the restaurants and grocery stores. And I think, and they are public, but Stony Brook is public, but it just doesn't have, I think it's maybe the research one university distinction compared to teaching schools. And I always was around teaching colleges. And there is a difference in my opinion. Like I feel research universities, they're trying to make themselves known to the public, but I do think they could learn a lot from teaching colleges and from ones who really are the fabric of their community. Like where people in the community go to the university all the time because they're attending performances or they're attending lectures for the public. Like that's like you're saying, that's where the university can step in and have more public courses. Like I always think, why aren't academics at the public libraries? Like there's so many ways or the cafes, right? Having like a round table, like things that are for the public, but also you're still representing your department. Hi, this is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and I'm so excited to shout out the Gay and Lesbian Review, who is helping to sponsor the ITBR podcast. For all of you out there, the Gay and Lesbian Review is a bi-monthly magazine where you can discover new things about gay and lesbian literature, history, and culture. And the GL Review publishes essays in a wide range of disciplines, as well as a slew of reviews of books, plays, and movies, and a number of special features, such as artist profiles and their popular art memo column. Each issue of the magazine brings you consistently intelligent, lively, thought-provoking articles focused on a unifying theme. For example, their September-October issue centers on the theme Cracking the Closet. So, starting the 19th century, a number of artists and writers found ways to crack the closet by expressing their sexuality between the lines or in the interstices of their work. For example, Ignacio Darnad, who is a friend of the ITBR podcast, he's been on our show, writes all about illustrator J.C. Leyendecker, whose work for Ivory Soap and Arrow Collars gave him plenty of opportunities to draw pictures of well-dressed and at times scantily dressed American men. And you also can find an article by Vernon Rosario, who has been on the podcast, and he talks about the quest for sex in the Middle Ages. So to subscribe, visit glreview.org. That's G-L-R-E-V-I-E-W dot org. Click subscribe. So on their website, go all the way over to the right-hand side and you'll see the button subscribe. Click subscribe and enter the promo code ITBR50 because you're getting 50% off your subscription to the print or digital edition of the Gay and Lesbian Review magazine. I can't wait for you all to have your copy of the Gay and Lesbian Review magazine and make sure that you take a picture when your magazine arrives or when you're reading it online and tag the GL Review on Instagram and ITBR and we'll share it out in our stories. Enjoy your reading, everyone. Happy winter. Happy holidays. I hope you all are merry and bright out there. I am here in Port Jefferson, New York on Long Island in one of my favorite stores. It is the Soapbox NY 
a Bath and Body Boutique. I'm here with one of the co-owners, Janine. Hi, Janine. Happy holidays. Hi, Andrew. How are you? Thank you. Good. So I know you have many winter scents to walk us through. So let's yes. get started because there's a lot to talk about and it's exciting. So what is this that I'm holding? This is a hand wash by one of our favorite companies, Greenwich Bay. Uh, it's a gingerbread scent, which is wonderful, very Christmassy, very holiday-ish. And you can follow it up by using Greenwich Bay's lotion. It's a hand and body lotion. And to keep with that gingerbread scent is a um, sugar whip scrub. It's a body scrub that you could use in the shower. And it's by a company called Primal Elements. And it's something I'm actually using currently. And I said to Janine, and she always laughs, uh, that I really feel like I'm in Santa's bakery. So, oh, it is so yummy. It's, good. it's a good one. And then what are these adorable little yep. soap gifts? Jumping back to Greenwich Bay. This is a great little grab and go gift. Uh, great for a stocking stuffer. There are mini soaps by Greenwich Bay. And it just gives you a little sample of some of their mini soaps to try. Ooh, peppermint, yeah. mistletoe, holly, yeah, it's wonderful. cranberry. Yeah, and there's some um, red in there too. And then what is this room spray? This is from company Michelle Design Works, another one of our favorites. Room spray that you can use any room in your house, just kind of freshens up the room a bit. And then what is this by Michelle Design Works? Also by Michelle Design Works is Winter Blooms, one of their new scents this holiday season. It's great. It's um, a hand wash. You can use it in your kitchen or your bathroom. And then here is something to follow it up with. Exactly. It's a hand and body lotion. And then what is this beautiful decorative candle here? One of our favorites that we actually sell mm. all year round because it's so popular. This is the scent of Fraser Fur by Times. I think I'm becoming addicted to it. Yes. I think you are because you already own one, I believe. I own one and it is a decorative candle for me because I'm about to open it, but it's just in such I know the a beautiful is, package. I don't know what's better, the packaging or the scent. I'm using it wonderful. as a holiday decoration. So cool. I'll get to the candle eventually, Thank everyone. You but it's wonderful because with Times and their Fraser fur, not only do they carry the candles, but they also make it in the sense in the diffuser, in soap, the hand lotion, the um, the hand soap. It's just a great line and a great scent. We're going to be Fraser furred uh, crazed this holiday season. I love it. And yeah. then what are these so adorable pajamas? My friends next to me, uh, a company called Hello Mellow. But these pajamas are so comfy. We have the t-shirts with the pajama pants. These happen to be the nutcrackers. One of my favorite this holiday season. And then they have the night shirts too. And they're so comfy. And it says, oh, what, what fun, fun with the little Santa hat. Yes. And we have others as well. So Janine, how can everyone out there get their hands on your hand and body and even pajama products? Well, we'd be more than happy to see you in our shop. We're located at 18 Chandler Square in Port Jefferson Village. You could always call us to place an order. We're happy to ship to you. Our phone number is 631-509-1424. You can place an order on our website, soapboxny.com. And you could also find us on Instagram or TikTok at the soapboxny. So many options. Mm -hmm. I can't wait for all of you out there to just enjoy what I love so much about the Soapbox and Why. So with yeah, that, thank you so much. Happy winter, everyone. And this is going to keep you all, especially in the Northeast, merry and cheery with our cold, dark days. Yes, I know they're coming, unfortunately, but we'll yeah. survive. But this will get you that pep right, in your, your spirits. Step. Exactly. I think so too. Yes. There we go. Happy yes. holidays. Happy Bye, holidays. everyone. Thank you. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and I am so excited to be talking about Broadview Press. You might be asking, what is Broadview Press, Andrew? Broadview is an independent academic publisher in the humanities that produces high-quality, pedagogically useful books for use in university and college classrooms. They publish in the humanities mainly English studies, writing, philosophy, and history, just to name a few genres, and recently, I had on Dr. Jason Holt, who wrote all about the philosophy of sport. And what better summer episode than to talk about what happens when a philosopher dissects the beautiful aesthetics of sporting culture. In the spring, I had on Drs. Kyle Stedman and Tanya Rodriguez to talk about what is sound writing, how to make audio projects in the college classroom, how to even have your students create podcasts. 
And then in the winter, I had on Dr. E Dr. Jeffrey Weinstock. He talked about analyzing pop culture. Yes, I even sneak in some Real Housewives questions and how to teach composition and make it fun. He uses this whole metaphor about being a mad scientist in this gothic lab. And in the fall, I had on Dr. Ann Stevens, and she talked about literary theory and criticism. And yes, the university season is upon us. So what better way to talk about the college classroom than to actually understand what is literary theory? That's a wonderful episode for all of you out there who teach literary studies. I love Broadview Press. Make sure you use their exclusive code. It's Ivory Tower on broadviewpress.com. You get 20% off all all Broadview Press publications. Okay, until the next Broadview Press interview, and now back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Yeah, and it, it sort of, um, like it gives me a bit of a, um, an entryway to talk about um, the Matter Museum that you mentioned in the intro and, um, and kind of what's happening there, because it, it's so relevant just to the way the conversation is is flowing for us. You know, I was so lucky to have three research fellowships at the Matter Museum. Um, the first two were for Afterlives, which was my nonfiction book. The third was actually I applied purely as a poet to go in and work with um, part of these three books that are part of their collection of anthropodermic books, which are books bound in human skin. Um, and I had written about that phenomenon in Afterlives because I'm thinking a lot in that book about how the 19th century related to the human body, both as an object of scientific or anatomical material and as a beloved ghost, you know, how we mourn. Um, but there were so many, as I was researching Afterlives, and one of the most valuable things that the PhD, the PhD gave me was the ability to go and do archival research and be in the physical presence of someone else's creative process. You know, that was just, I'll, I'll be forever grateful for that. But um, at the Motor Museum, you know, I had the capacity to work with these texts as both a scholar and a creative. Um, and it was game changing like that. Um, the last half of Calenture, is a suite of poems called an elementary treatise on human anatomy that were inspired by the archives at the Motor Museum. Um, the title, Kalinchua, is actually a 19th century medical diagnosis and it's specifically a tropical fever that afflicted sailors who suffered from a very specific hallucination. Mm -hmm. They saw the sea as a green field and they would leap overboard and drown because their desire for that grassy mirage was so great. And you can imagine the Whitmanian correlations that I found there. And yeah, the grass, yes. Really interesting moments in my own biography. Like the first time I read the word, I'm sitting in the reading room at the Matter Museum and I, I was reading about, I stumbled across, across this in a, a book of 19th century medical um, diseases, like a sort of um, encyclopedia and I had this vision of my sister, my late sister, Amanda, um, diving from the cliffs into this lake um, called Katala near where we lived. And that particular summer, there was an algal bloom. So the water was incredibly green. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just sort of arrested by this image. And I knew that that would become a book in that moment. You know, at the time that I was there, the Mutter Museum had an extraordinary director, Robert Hicks, who's become a phenomenal mentor and dear friend of mine. And he was extraordinary in opening the collections to artists, to writers, to filmmakers. Um, and not only that, he would take Civil War medical kits and go to public schools in inner city Philadelphia and do a Civil War medical clinic. So he'd give the students a list of symptoms and they got to be, you know, um, the soldier with gangrene who's going to need his um, arm amputated or with dysentery. Um, you know, he would have hospital day at the museum where he would turn the museum into a hospital and bring all these students in. He was about breaking down those those borders. Mm. Um, in the last six months, for reasons that are 
baffling and mysterious to many of us who have loved that institution. Um, the CEO who's just stepped down and the, the new director um, are trying to close the museum to anyone but doctors. They've removed the entire YouTube channel. They've removed many of the specimens that were donated by people with an intention and a bequest that people learn from these specimens. Um, so there's a real sense of a kind of inversion of what you and I are talking about, of going from an institution that is so open. And there's a real sense, it's something else that I think is so important to both you and I, which is a sense of the body's transcendence, the body's capacity for, um, you know, a kind of Whitmanian ecstatic grace. And how we come to that is always an encounter with our mortality. You know, um, so many people talk about, um, you know, people who've worked in the museum talk about people coming there when they've gotten a cancer diagnosis. Um, I myself went there with my best friend who had survived brain cancer and sat there or stood there looking at the brain specimens and looking at her. And it's one of the most profound moments of my life, you know? So it's an institution that can have such a profound impact on people. And yet we're, you know, we're going into this place of closing off as opposed to, you know, rant over. <laughs> no, no, no. This is so just poignant and palpably I can feel that pain in your voice. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, what I thought when the Met Art Museum decided that they were going to now stop the like, pay what you wish, unless you're a New York resident. And I thought, so like, if you're in New Jersey, now you have to pay the set fee, Connecticut, it just did not. And I think that any pay what you wish, it brought in so many, like, I would even just go to the art museum for an hour and be like, well, I paid $5 and I just want to see this one room. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, not even just because of that, you know, change in decision, because I can pay what I wish. I'm a New York resident, but I want to take friends. And then I realize, wait, no, they're now limited by the pay. And I understand boards make decisions and there's financial issues right now with keeping these institutions alive. But I just wish there was a collect, like you've said, why can't we do have a collective vision of these organizations and that saddens me to hear about the mutter museum because it's a place that so many of my friends and anyone in the philly area rave about it i mean it's up there with one of my favorite music i mean philly i was back in philly recently Lindsay, and i just love i was in society hill and head house square one of my favorite neighborhoods like yeah. anyone who's out there who's like you know, near Philly or goes to Philly, I always say Old City, Society Hill, Queen Village, Washington Square West, mm -hmm. you know, going journeying to Rittenhouse. There's mm -hmm. just such a heart in Philly. And it's there in New York, but it's like, I call it the little sibling to New York. It like has all New York's charm, but it's just concentrated. And you that's, always that's talk to new people. Yeah. Like, they're just so friendly. I mean, New Yorkers are friendly too, but I think it's just so neighborhoody. And um, yeah, yeah, it's, well, I hope that the Mutter Museum, I'm assuming there's a lot of pressure on them now. From yeah, the, so I'll say a couple like of important things about that. The first one is that the campaign Protect the Mutter, find them on Instagram. There's a petition via their Instagram you'll be able to get to that petition. It's already got 30 something thousand signatures. Um, there've been articles in the Washington Post, the Guardian, the New York Times, all the major Philadelphia newspapers and media outlets. Um, and the CEO has stepped down as a result of it. That happened just last week. Um, so I'm certainly no expert. I've been watching this from afar with great um, trauma. Um, but, you know, um, the the friends of the matter, you know, the matter <laughs> kind of cohort of um, uh, morbidly curious um, people are 
definitely all over it. So, you know, anyone who's concerned can find them that way. And I think there's, there's, there's room for optimism for sure. Yes. And it's also why I feel like a good future vision is when museums have joined forces and you can get, be a member to multiple museums. Like they're reciprocal. Mm -hmm. I've gone to the Mount, Edith Wharton's home um, in the Berkshires. Oh, you would, have you been there, Lindsay? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a place She's that you'll- She's my favorite 19th century novelist. So I yes, need to go. Yes. <laughs> they have a writer's residency. Um, yeah, you'll have to add it to your list. Uh, so what I love is they're also part of like the NASA County Art Museum that's near me and all of these museums. They've all joined like the North American Reciprocal Organization. That's not exact, NARM. Yeah, North. I think it's North American Reciprocal Museums. But I hope that that's our future because I feel that these places need to join forces. And that's actually brings us back to academia, which is they need to join forces with writers and artists mm -hmm. and performers and media people like to just, I always say not every academic needs to start a podcast nor um, needs to put themselves out there if they're uncomfortable. Like I never have a dictum, like you need to do exactly this venue because you open yourself up to criticism and the social media space, which, you know, I get naysayers, but I'm also ready for this. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure Lindsay, something I did want to ask as we're nearing our end, which I'm always going to talk with you. <laughs> <laughs> on our off time here, you know, we'll always have our conversations, but for the audience out there, which I'm sure there are those listening who are contemplating their next steps, they're maybe feeling insecure in their jobs, they realize they want to go into a different endeavor. How do you look back now on the naysayers or those who maybe even questioned you going full-time as a creative writer? Like, how do you reflect back on the critics in your life and get through it? How do you get through the criticism? Yeah, so I think um, there's a line by the poet Diana Fault that I have, I'm not at home right now, but when I'm at home, it, it is typed above my desk. Perfection is not a prerequisite for anything but pain. Mm. And I think one of the most damaging through lines of like the rigors of peer review and academic research and things like that is that if you have that kind of perfectionistic tendency, it will really turn the volume over that kind of imposter syndrome tendency. Um, I, you know, I actually in my, when I finally was deciding to leave, it was an Australian poet um, who I, I won't name because I haven't um, cleared this with him, but who was also an academic, but he had made the decision many years ago to go down to halftime because it wasn't possible um, for him to write while doing a, a full-time teaching load, um, the output that he wanted um, to create. And he really said to me, you know, you're probably going to have to choose. Um, so I did have some really good guidance in that sense, but there were also a number of people who probably thought I was a bit crazy. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I don't, I'm always a bit careful with synchronicity narratives, right? Because it's very difficult to be an optimist in the world that we're in right now. Um, and it can be dangerous. I think synchronicity narratives or manifestation narratives can be really dangerous. Mm. Um, having said that, you know, because there are incredible difficulties and hardships that we all are going to face. Having said all of that, you know, um, when I just gave myself permission to be a writer who writes and to own that, and I started putting that on my on everything I did. So if I have to enter the country, I'll put writer as my occupation. That's what's on my tax. You know, um, I started to actually identify this as a profession and as a job. 
and take some of the the mystery out of it. You know, I, I quietly love books about creativity, even though I don't always enjoy them. Imagine that you're riding the Turner Classic movie, Great Movie Ride, in Hollywood Studios. It's in the 1990s. As you're journeying through the Great Movie Ride, you pass the Wizard of Oz, where all of a sudden you see the Wicked Witch of the West ascend into Munchkinland in a cloud of smoke and flames. Well, that's the memory I have with the Great Movie Ride in classic cinema when I was at Disney in the 1990s as a young boy. And ever since that, I was hooked on classic cinema. Well, my friend Christian Garcia, friend of the Ivory Tower Boiler Room, has a podcast that you all are going to love. It's called That Old Gay Classic Cinema, and he looks at queer themes in classic cinema, like Vertigo, The Wizard of Oz, Sleeping Beauty, Mary Poppins, 101 Dalmatians, Hello Dolly, the list can go on and on and on. So follow him on Instagram at That Old Gay Classic Cinema. You can listen to his podcast on Apple and Spotify. Spotify. And he also is on the premiere episode of our Queer as Folk podcast, where I'm rewatching every episode of Queer as Folk from 2000. And the episodes come out bi weekly. So make sure you listen to his episode with me. And he's launching a rewatch show of Smash, where they're putting on a Marilyn Monroe musical. So he's going to be joined by co-hosts, a lot who are in the Broadway and theater industry, and I'm going to be on his first episode. So without further ado, get listening to That Old Gay Classic Cinema. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. Happy almost holiday season. Because the holidays are upon us, I'm sure so many of you out there are thinking, oh my, what am I going to get my friends, my family, my children, my romantic partner, my husband, my wife, any, you know, significant person in your life. Look no further than my good friend, Mandy Bangle, who makes handmade crocheted items. Her company is called Mandy Made It. You can follow her on Instagram at M-A-N-D-E-E Made It. And you will see all of these crocheted items that she's going to be able to customize for you, including special characters, sports team figures, even holiday items like a snowflake or a Christmas tree. So I have Mandy's keychains. I have the poison apple from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. I have a rainbow um, flag that she made me. So Mandy is able to really customize an order just depending on what your hobbies and passions are. And you know, what item you're really looking for. So because you're listening to me talk about Mandy, she said that anyone who goes to Mandy Made It on Instagram and orders from her, and they've heard the Ivory Tower Boiler Room ad, she will give you all a free Ivory Tower Boiler Room t-shirt with your order. So head right now to Mandy Made It. You know, if you were really looking for that special gift, now you don't have to look any further because I have you covered with Mandy Made It. Okay, I hope you all enjoy your items from Mandy Made It. And please make sure that you take a photo of your crocheted items so that we can share it out on our social media. I know Mandy would love that and I would love to see what you all are ordering from her. She even has an adorable pillow called Netflix and Chill. And she has these cute coasters that she crochets for your favorite coffee or tea mug. So enjoy all your Mandy Made It products. Um, And one of my favorites is, which is some real tough love, is is the War of Art. Um, And one of the things um, that Pressfield talks about in that book is the sense in which you have to um, treat it like a job you know, and there's a magic, there's an alchemy, there are these moments of real transcendent grace when you're in flow state and things just happen, but there's also the sense of just dragging your ass out of bed at 5 a.m. or whatever time and just sort of doing the work, and I think um, in terms of the critics um, or the people who doubted that decision, for me, many of them came from a place of love, 
you know, and those are the hardest critics to sort of tangle with, because I think they were concerned that I was giving up, you know, whatever semblance of security we can have in these institutions, which is, you know, that's debatable um, for something that was very, um, very insecure. Um, and, you know, um, that that is something that I still struggle with, you know, that doubt. Um, but then things just sort of happen, you know, like the residency um, at Work Vogue, you know, and I had another writer's residency early this year, earlier this year in Australia um, at Bundan on Trust, which is a, um, a really extraordinary art gallery and national park that was bequeathed to, to Australia by one of our most important painters, Arthur Boyd um, of the mid-century. So, you know, things have kind of happened as I have owned that as a profession, as opposed to an art form. So I think that's probably, if that answers your question, been an important distinction for me is to say, yes, I create poetry, I create fiction, I create creative nonfiction, but it's my profession to do that, you know. And that you can hold all sides of your creative self, like to realize that you are in control of telling your own narrative. Like I felt once I was able to explain the narrative to myself, it doesn't matter now if someone's questioning how I'm living my life because they're living in an old model and that's on them. And like you said, they want to come from love. It is always usually from their fear of you not being secure in what they think is um, a traditional model. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of my last questions to follow up with you on what you've just said, Lindsay, is do you feel that when it comes to censoring ideas or being more free flowing and allowing yourself to take vulnerable risks in your writing. Do you find that your creative voice or just your writerly voice, not just creative writing, but nonfiction writing is stronger now than it was when you were at a university? Yeah, for sure. Um, I even, you know, like I was, and, and it's interesting because there is space and there are some extraordinary Extraordinary scholars who are creating this space, you know, like um, I got asked late 2020, I think it was, um, by Ken Price um, and Stefan Schoberlein to be part of the Oxford Handbook um, of Walt Whitman. And they were really kind in allowing me or inviting me to write about the intersection between my poetry and my scholarly work on Whitman. But as I came to approach that essay and think about how those two things were intertwined for me in ways that are really kind of impossible to untangle, um, the town that I grew up in, which is where my family still lives, of Mayfield, Kentucky, was devastated by a tornado, like the, the center, the old historic center of the town and, and huge swaths of it were just wiped off the map. Um, and that became really enmeshed with my thinking about Whitmanian elegy and the collective and how we mourn a place, you know, and how we mourn um, not just in singularity, but how we can be hospitable to, you know, the bodies of so many beloveds, right? Um, and I found that it just wasn't possible for me to not write, to, to be writing in that space and not write that. So I approached them and said, could I weave this in? And they allowed me to write what is a very personal essay, you know, about my relationship with Whitman, about living through this loss in real time, you know, and, you know, I, I sort of sent the page proofs off the final edits while I was at Work Vaux and I called my mom and I said, you know, I've written our little backwater Kentucky town into Oxford. You know, so there is there is space for that. There are extraordinary people making space for that. Sometimes you have to ask for it, you know, because it's a little bit outside the box. Um, but yes, I think, you know, but the, the me that, that would even ask that question, 
can I do this? Was if I was still at the university, I wouldn't have asked the question. I would have just written the brief they asked me to write, you know. So there is a freedom in being the master of my own, you know, output and and creative world, as you well know, that gives you that, that kind of emboldens you to say, I don't, I'd really rather do it this way, you know. <laughs> or like, if you feel you have to keep begging for an opportunity, I just, and that's not, it is, it's a value of, I know my work and my art. And I can tell if someone wants to collaborate and they're a good actor in this endeavor and we're helping each other. But you know, there's opportunities where you feel that it's coming out of an egotistic, egotistical battle. And I'm like, Andrew, this is not worth your stress level. Like, if you feel you have to defend or explain why you're doing what you're doing, then that's not right for you right now in the universe. Let it go. Because the opportunity comes again. Something does come along, I feel. Yeah. It, you make that space. It's, you know, it's extraordinary what will, what will fill it, what will come to the surface to fill it. You know, um, like one of my other favorite books about writing um, is Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way, um, which you would probably really love if you haven't read it. I'm going to add it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. she, um, you know, it's, it's a sort of workbook. So you go through week by week. Um, and she get to a particular week, this might put everybody off, but don't be put off. That's reading deprivation week where you're actually uh, not allowed to read or consume any story, you know, um, and, and in the, you know, this was written in a, in a more analog age, but you can do that to whatever degree is possible for you or that you're willing to, um, willing or capable of engaging with. But, you know, for that week, you're not allowed to read, to watch, to consume stories, to see what kind of comes up in your own. And it is this magic, extraordinarily birthing painful, you know, <laughs> but this hugely generative act that I, that I will do um, periodically. Um, so, yeah. So, I know that, Lindsay, you had prepared either, I think, one or two poems. And I thought if you could read one of your poems right now, it would be such a treat just for myself to hear, the audience to hear. Um, and I'd love to make space for that because this is just, I feel it's the cherry on top of a really powerful conversation. So thank you for you know, agreeing to read one of your poems. Oh, it's an honor and a delight. I've got one ready here called The Specimen Dream. Um, and this, you'll notice a nod to Whitman in the title. Um, that's both a nod to Whitman's specimen soldiers that he tended during the Civil War. Um, and those extraordinarily erotic and transcendent um, and convalescent relationships that he had. It's also a bit of a dig at Freud. Um, and it, who, um, it, it does a kind of similar work to Whitman, but in a very different way. Um, so part of the collection that I'm currently working on, which is called the Autopsy Elegies, um, and the, the idea of it came out of that work I did with the human skin bound books at the Mutter Museum and thinking about all of these through lines of violence that as women we inherit to the degree that they become both banal and you know deeply um, traumatic but they also um, you know can be in a sense um, unifying experiences um, and so that's sort of what this poem is about. Although having said that, I really prefer to think of poetry um, as being a bit untranslatable. Like that's the, the reason why I think we create art is to translate something that's outside of linear language. Um, so I sort of prefer poetry to be a little bit like a conversation you overheard in a dream you half remember it feels true in a way that burrows into your bones, even if you can't quite pinpoint why. Um, so this poem is 
is pretty new and it's called The Specimen Dream. Everyone was talking about the weather the year we learned to fear a touch. We were so lovely and unharmed a girl ago. Oracles marked by fits and starts, fluent only in rapture. Slow limbed and grass stained, amnesiac after the first sip. This is the new past, a steady progression of scars and acolytes. Transience is essential to our survival. Wanting to go all out, we settled on strict rations, a diet of mirage and cured meats. Regarding suffering, she said, it's all in the technique. Now our wounds glow like radium girls, green-sleeved, half-lived, radiant as ghosts on their way home. We are still paying for our own atrocity tours. Pastel girls, bellwether violent ends, hewn in so many bodies of water. Their limbs never felt the blank space where another body once rested. So much depends on preserving the stain of their dirty feet against white sheets. We inherit their glassine eyes and brittle bones, their unmade beds of hair, their way of standing perfectly still. All our borrowed gestures of protection for winter, for warmth, echo the clouds of their breath in the cold. We do not ask to see their fate or ours. It is not always better to know. Aftermaths are trauma's fingerprints, always beckoning. Indelible as laughter in the hippocampus, a face so familiar it threatens to shatter the screen you fumble to pocket. When the fires won't light and the rituals hearken only despair, keep your dead well covered and your prophecies false. Remember to remember what her face looked like in sleep. How the undying tugs at me, an animal within an animal, home to her still singing limbs. Oh, wow. Oh, that is so, <laughs> that is just hits so many registers, Lindsay. Thank you so much for reading that. And just for your presence, you always are such a calming force. I feel you're, you know, I feel that I'm so bonded to you, not only as you know, friends, but also you really recognizing and giving me courage to be my artistic self. So I want to thank you for that, Lindsay. You are a mentor of mine. And it means so much for me to see just your poetry and all your writing taking off. And I love the work that you do. I can't wait for your novel. So you'll have to come back when that happens. Um you know, so we can add novelist to your resume. <laughs> um, but Lindsay, oh, how can everyone find you? I know you have a website with all your work. Yes, um, it's lindsaytuggle.com, I'm pretty sure. Just Lindsay. There are two Lindsay Tuggles. One is a filmmaker. Um, <laughs> so if you turn up on a, um, a filmmaker, that's not me. But Lindsay, is, I'm pretty sure it's just lindsaytuggle.com. Lindsay Tuggle will get you there. I'm also on Instagram as Lindsay Tuggle sporadically, but there. <laughs> good, and good. So I have all the um, links to Lindsay's website, her Instagram and in our show notes. So you can easily find it and get your hands on her work. Lindsay, this has been so wonderful. Thank you for joining me in the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Thank you so much, Andrew. It's a delight. Okay, bye to the audience and bye to Lindsay on the recording. <laughs> <laughs>